I cannot believe, yeah, I can too, because I've seen it happen before. I've experienced it. Pat, how in the world did you choose the music this morning, knowing where my, what my sermon was on? Oh, 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 now, no wonder, no yeah. wonder. She's in touch <laughs> with the Lord. That's understandable now. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing. I don't know why God gave me this sermon this morning. I don't ever question that. But I've never preached this sermon before in my life. It's a new and newser when I'm supplying. I preach back some back, back in the back. And it's much work. But what I heard from this pulpit already this morning about what's fixing to happen to you folk as you look toward the future and how you're going to plan the future, that's my sermon. Right down to the nail. It's that right there. And I believe it came to me simply because as a director of missions, well, it goes back before then. When I was in Dothan, Alabama, as a pastor, first of all, the committee didn't tell me. They didn't tell me the kind of mess the church was in. It took one deacon's meeting about two weeks after I got there when I realized, hey, boy, you were in a fire that you didn't start. Ten o'clock we got through. I never had a deacon's meeting that long. But that church is split by the record 165 to 164. And the others went down the road, started another church. For five years, that was hell. But God brought something magnificent in it as we moved through that experience. So the night, today, the title of my sermon is simply this. In a few moments, I'm going to get to the scripture, but a little bit later than normal. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk to you, first of all, where I'm going with this sermon. How am I going to get there? I, I want to identify the ultimate conclusion of this sermon right now. Keep in mind that we are read, going to read from Philippians chapter 3. The love letter Paul is writing to the Philippian church. Uh, he's an old man now, and because of this uh, uh, <clears throat> participation, his participation in, in God's plan, uh, his, God's big plan, uh, he's, he's in jail. Now, you don't want to call a preacher like that today, do you? But, but if you're going to call somebody like Paul, he was in jail a lot of times. But here he was in Rome. He was there because he had met Jesus and had identified his life with a great picture that God has for the church. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Uh, <clears throat> Paul's ambition, his goals in life, the force that, that drove Paul's life was his determination to be more like Jesus. The journey that Paul was introduced to on the road to Damascus is the theme of this sermon. Because it's the theme of this music we've been singing this morning about Calvary, what Jesus did on the cross, how it's supposed to change our lives to be more like Jesus. You know, Paul was being trained by Gamaria. You know, I was telling the story this morning. One of the ladies right here on the row, she remembered the story that I, the only thing she remembered about my story back before most of you were born when I was preaching revival here. But I had fallen and made, when after I made my bed as a little small five-year-old, I made my bed into a trampoline and it didn't work. It didn't work at all. I cut my tongue almost completely off and even now words slip up on me. I, it, my tongue just doesn't do it. And I'm going to tell you what I did in school. 
and, and I learned to play the trumpet. But I couldn't triple tongue because of my tongue. And so my, my band director had written this big thing about, uh, he came out of vaudevilles. You know, I know most of you don't remember that, but, but, but uh, he wrote this music for a group of us and, and, and it was funny stuff. Everything was to make people funny. And us kids, we, we, we did music two or three, oh, hey, that was our life. We did music, this, this little group did, I mean, hundreds of times. Just, people would just die laughing. And my, my title of my solo was Triple Tongue Poker. <laughs> triple Tongue Poker. And I couldn't triple tongue. And I made a mess of it. And everybody just dear, died, died laughing at me. But that was part of the story that this lady right over here remembered about when I was, she didn't know what I was preached, but she remembered that story. <laughs> but you know, but here we go. God has a way of working in our lives to put us where we need to be. So Paul is looking back in this scripture we're fixing to read on how he allowed this journey. See, the Christian faith is a journey that created a new purpose for his life. This man had a purpose for his life. He was going to be the number one Pharisee. As a kid, he was being taught and mentored to be that when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. His journey was, uh, well, as he chased this, this journey, uh, the process of that journey was was a driving force which was, which was going to make him more like Jesus. Uh, and and, and here's, here's, the, here's the, where I'm going with that right quick. Like, you know, God's king, kingly reign, that's the, the, the kingdom of God, becomes our steering system as you and I navigate the currents of life be, to become the person that God wants in his kingdom. We be, we're come becoming God's citizen in his kingdom. And we're to represent him. And the reason Paul became a Christian is because I think he saw Jesus crucified. I don't know that. I think, but he did know he saw one of those disciples named Stephen. He held the clothes of the people that was stoning Stephen. And I think the the community of believers somehow it impacted the life of Paul and on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus because those early Christians were identifying with the very purpose and the ministry, the big picture of God as he dealt with us. Now, uh, as we, we, we think a moment about that, what, what, I, I, listen to the scripture and listen to what Paul lost, and listen to what Paul gained. Okay, here we go with the scripture. Uh, starting in, in uh, uh, verse 7 of Philippians 3. But whatever was gained were lost to me. I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. See, he gained, he lost. He lost that, that, possible a future to become the head Pharisee. He lost all of that. What is, what is more? I consider everything a loss because of suppressing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is brought through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Jesus or Christ. Yes, to know the power of the resurrection and the participation in his suffering because like him in his death. And so now somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained all this. I think right now, sometimes 
we think, hey, I got saved. I'm there. I'm ready. Oh, everything's okay. But if you hear what Paul is saying, he is saying, here I am as an old man. And I've been bruised physically time and time and time again all because of the gospel. But he was saying, look, all that I think I gained at one time, I've lost this garbage. But now I know Jesus more than anything else. And so he goes on and he says, but, but I, I press on to take hold of that which, which is Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind. Wow. Charlotte and I have done marriage and ritual retreats all over the world, as far away as Thailand, England, over North Dakota and everything in between. But as we counsel with couples that were in trouble, they had never dealt with their past. So much of the past we need to get over and move on and lose that which is hindering our steps toward to be like Jesus. Uh, but one thing I do not forget, I press toward the, the goal to win the prize of which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who mature, mature as a process, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will take clear, make clear to you. Only let us give up what we have already. Uh, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Now, I, I want to now just divert from that story and come back to it at the end. And I'm going to make one point that's going to take most of the other time. And the other two points is going to be real quick. But I'm going to go back to the story of creation. The reason I'm going to go back to the story of crea creation, we need to see God's big picture. What does God want from all of us? What is he... Why is he doing what he's doing? And then we identify our lives with that. So right here in, in, in this, this note, note and, and, and I'm going to read that scripture to you. Notice that in, in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Genesis, Now no scrub had yet been appeared on the earth. No plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Oh, you know what he's saying? It's very simple. Hey, I'm not through with creation. Creation is not completed. And so God's in this time send some rain. No one, there was no one to work on this earth. And God says, wow, I've created this beautiful place, but there's no one to work. Work was not a curse. You know, somewhere I think when God did what he took some dust and he made a man. You know what I thought? Here's my image of that man that God made out of dust. You ever seen a mannequin? You ever seen? Yeah, I know you have many times. I think it looked like a mannequin. But God did something that only God can do. He made that mannequin into human flesh. And then he made that mannequin to have a soul. And so God right there creates the very person that he made that's here today, you and me. He gave us a soul and he gave us a physical body. Now, <clears throat> Two things we need to remember here. In verse 18, here's what he says. He says, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. What he is saying, I'm going to make a family. Do you realize what he's also saying here? I'm going to make people that can have a relationship with me. My, the greatest earthly relationship I have 
And it's been going on for over 64 years since right here. I wouldn't trade it for, a dime, for any amount of money. But that's the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with each other. You know, so God says, Adam, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. I think it's also saying, look, and when you see my big picture, I want you to know right now, you can't do it alone. You got to have each other. It's almost like a church is almost like a marriage. And when it's divorced, there's scars that you got to deal with. Because God will reveal to you where you were and how you can repent of your sins and get your fellowship cleansed. That's part of the big picture. Because when God, well, look, let me just say it like this. God is, God wants us right here. He's telling us here in this story in the Garden of Eden. And he is saying, hey, I want you to live in heaven. The Garden of Eden was a message from God saying, I want you to live in heaven. How do you define heaven? I don't think you can beat this de definition. Heaven is where God is. Where was God with Adam and Eve in the garden? Walking with them, fellowshipping with them, communion with them. And he also instructed them what they were to do. And when they got away from those instructions, what happened? They were expelled from the garden. But when they were expelled from the garden, God did not leave them alone. There was an act of grace. God clothed them. God had already prepared for them food. And God had already prepared to protect them from wild animals and etc. That was an act of grace. We see God responding to his creation in a redemptive way. That's God's big picture. You know, I always ask myself, you know, where, where, is, where is God? Where is God? I've already said where God is. He's with me. He's with you. I don't understand that. But I know that out of experience. So God's long-range plan is that he wants Adam and Eve, you and me, to be in fellowship with him. Let me say one thing about fellowship. I was very close to Ronnie and Richard. I grew up with them. We did things we ought not to do. We went to church together. We, we went to school together. But geography se se separated us. And now we've been trying to, that's been years ago, folk, years ago. But we're trying to get back together. Both of them live in North Carolina. And my, my point to you is that sometimes we allow things to move us away from God. And, and, and our journey with, with God gets somewhat stale. And, and I've experienced that in this, this pandemic. I have never, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the bunny, that, that's the energized bunny. And all of a sudden I'm having to stay home because Charlotte is sick and she's had all these heart procedures and doing much better now, thank God. And, and, and my life was just totally changed. And I got, I got a little depressed. I got a little depressed. But I came back and asked myself, God, where are you? He gave me an answer. He said, I'm in the midst of my creation and you are a part of that. And I'm trying to get your attention because I want a better relationship with you. God, where are you? Well, he, he, he reminded me, I'm your hope. 
What did I see in, in God's great big picture in the very beginning of, of, of creation? You saw heaven. Hope is heaven. I met Scott, been his friend a long time. I think I baptized him. I know I married him and his wife. And she's in the nursing home. She doesn't know anybody. No one. And he has to stand at the window and look at her. Sad. Sad. It can't be helped. I met him the other day in a store in Heflin. And he walked up to me and with tears in his eyes, he said, Brother Don, I got a question to ask you. I said, what is it, Scott? He said, Danita, you know where she is, and you know how bad off she is with Alzheimer's. He said, do you think maybe God has already taken her soul, and that's just her old body wearing out? You know, I had to say, Scott, that's your hope. That's where you get hope. See, God created hope when he created you and me because hope is where God is. I tell you nothing, he, 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 he also has developed, he's developing, developing us the, the passion to be a good citizen of the kingdom. There are ways in which we, we see God working in our lives and we become passionate about it. There's some things in my life that I, I'm just really, really passionate about because of my relationship to Jesus Christ. He's also the emotional glue that, that sees us through the turmoil crisis of our lives. He's the magnetic pull that, that leads you and me to the very best way for you to serve his kingdom. That's God's big picture. And you are part of it. God has not abandoned you. You might have to discover your re, a, 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 a redirection. And all my life, I, could, I don't want to identify it now, but I can, for, I, when I was preparing this, I, just, I realized four different times when, when there were major times in my life when I had to stop and redirect my life. But guess what? God was with me. And one of the questions I want to ask you in point one is, how big is your God? How big is your God? You know, <clears throat> here's a point I want you to hear. The first point is, is God. How big is he? And my second point is simply this. What, what kind of, of maturing process uh, you have in your life that helps you to be more like Jesus. I have a friend that I met in this, this, this wedding. Uh, he was on Gene's side. He, he had had an experience in life and had prepared himself for this. He wanted to be a missionary pilot where he would take, in these remote areas, he would take missionaries and fly them to these remote places in the jungles and wherever else. But what he had to do, he had to learn. He had to learn how to fly a plane. He also had to learn how to follow a manual because he had to repair his own airplanes because there was no one within hundreds of miles of him that knew how to fly or how to repair that plane. And all the safety of flying was depend upon him. But his job was to take missionaries safely into the jungle or wherever 
and leave them for a short period of time and go back and get them. He had two manuals. The manual to repair that engine. And the second one was he had the Holy Bible. And that was the fact that when we know the Bible and the message of the Bible, the only question we ever need to ask ourselves when we're reading the Bible is, God, how is this supposed to change my life? How does it change my life? What, what, how are you saying, what are you saying in it to me? How do you change my life? So the th first thing is God. How big is your God? And what are you doing through the scriptures for God to change your life, to mature your life, to help you through those times when, you, when you're struggling with life and looking for where to go? God, when you see his big picture, he's got a plan for you. You just got to find it. But if you sit under a shade tree drinking ice cold lemonade, it will never happen. It will never happen. Never. You know, <clears throat> David's manual, flying the plane, helped him with his ministry. That was his skills. He, he learned what God wanted him to do, and then he developed the skills. I'm learning how God wants me to act in life. And he's giving me the Bible as my manual that will change my life to be more like him. And that's a maturing process that lasts as long as I'm breathing. But where is God? He's right here in my life. And he wants to change me. You know, I think there's one other thing. I'm going to quit right now. The king is calling each one of us to know the king. God, first and foremost, to know him. That process grows just like in my marriage with Charlotte. It has grown over the years. I know her better today than I have never known her. Sometimes I get upset with her, but she is upset with me. But I know her. I know she has love for me. And my hope is when, in our relationship is to know that we've gone through troubled times and we've been closer and closer together as we move through those times. God has that plan in our life for us together. We have to grow as good citizens of God's kingdom. And that's a process of becoming more like Jesus as we study the scriptures and we're dependent upon each other. And thirdly, it will always lead you to a point of action that encourages others to be citizens of God's kingdom. Three things. Know God. Process. Learn how your manual, the scriptures, are changing you to be more like Jesus. And when you see that happening in your life, I'll promise you, God is going to put opportunities before you to serve him like you have never experienced. And whatever is in the, your background, it becomes somewhat, if it's struggling, if it's something that interferes with that growth, like with Paul, the law, his desire to be politically a big guy, all that's going to be garbage because to know Jesus is to be in heaven right now. Because where is God? He's in heaven. And where is heaven? Wherever God is. And I believe from my heart, God is here today with you, each one of you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Sometimes we, we can't get where we need to be until we just get to the point of saying, I just, I don't know any other way but to turn to you. I get so wrapped up in my own life and the struggles that I have and maybe the, 
the depression that sometimes gets on top of us. But we've got to remember, all of that is to get on our attention so we can mature in the journey to know you and to walk with you just like Adam and Eve walked with you. And the hope that there's life hereafter and because of your relationship with each one of us, we have that hope that nothing can defeat our relationship to you. Oh God, just pull us together. May your love fill our hearts and our lives and we never forget what you did on the cross at Calvary to remove from us sin to pay for our sin so that we can walk with you in the garden In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a moment here of invitation, but there's a little parable that says, it's just one sentence. You know, Jesus said to this man who had found a rich field with some type of treasure in it, and he said, Jesus said to him, look, go and sell everything you have and buy that field. So my challenge to you is this. You have a treasure. That's in God's big picture. Sell everything you have and go and buy the field.